Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so in the following manner by emailing Steve McCarthy at McCarthyS at AmherstMA.gov. That's M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y-S at AmherstMA.gov. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the town website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. And uh, with that done, we'll call ourselves to order at 5.02 p.m. and take a roll call. Guest on. Here. Dylan. Here. And I'm here, and we have two absent, uh, Doug and Hallie. So, um, and let's, next thing is the public comment. Is there anyone here for general public comment? Raise your hand with the hand raising button. Not related, unrelated to what is on the agenda. No? Okay. All right, so we have a couple of guests. We have Manny Johanneke and is uh, the police chief coming, Steve? He was here a minute ago and it looks like we've lost him. Uh-oh, okay. So what we wanted to do is um, the police chief, we said, is that Chief Here Livingstone? Is. is that Chief Livingstone? Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna do the renewals and the licenses after, and we're gonna do Chief Livingstone and then Mandy Johanneke first. So welcome Chief Livingstone. Thank you for coming to our meeting. Oh, he's still blocked. I um, should be coming up. Here we go. Hi. Good evening, Morning. Chief. Good, hi, good evening. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you so much for coming. Um, of course. Thank you. We just wanted, I guess, to get your view on enforcement. There have been a lot of, or more than usual, ABCC um, enforcement actions in the town. And I guess we were just wondering um, like how we would go, like if we, the Board of License Commissioners were to take action or wanted to you know, do more enforcement, how that would work. Sure. So. Uh yeah, thanks for having me. And, you know, Steve kind of gave me a heads up of what was going on mm -hmm. um, in town with the um, ABCC. So let me give you a little background and history. Okay. With the previous relationship we had with the ABCC. Um, so Ted Mahoney was the director for forever at the ABCC. And we always had a great relationship with them and their, their constituents. So they would always call us um, and um, ask at the beginning of the year, hey, what do you need from us as a relationship wise perspective? And, you know, so we always had great communication. Um, when the ABCC was coming into town, in fact, we would always um, reach out to them and ask them to come into town for a very specific um, events. For instance, Blarney blowout, you know, the Hobart hoedown back in the day, we would always say, can you come in, work with our um, officers and do alcohol checks with the liquor stores leading up to the event. So, you know, if the event was gonna be on a Saturday, we would have the ABCC come in on Thursday, Friday, Saturday night and work with us. Um, so I was a little surprised when Steve reached out to me and said that there had been a couple of, um, members of the ABCC that had come in and, uh, you know, checks with, without notifying us because there was always the professional relationship that they would let us know they were coming into town and in fact requested us to join them in these um, uh, liquor checks. And so that is new to us. And I think they do have a new director, which is totally within their purview. You know, they're certainly allowed to do that. It's just unusual that they would do that. So right. uh, I was surprised by that when I heard from Steve that they had come in and done some liquor checks without anybody's knowledge. So um, now from my own agency, when it comes to compliance checks, as we call them, mm -hmm. we routinely have done those, you know, forever in existence, always, always all the way back when I was a young police officer we would do compliance checks at all the bars and restaurants on a regular basis. Um, and we would 
um, pick times when it was appropriate to do these as, as far as, um, you know, sometimes we would do them in August leading up to the return of the students. And then we would continue them through September and October. And typically we would do them um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights uh, when it, the bars were most busy and we would pick sp specific times. Sometimes we do them uh, multiple, multiple times in one night. So we would do them at eight o'clock then we would go back at 11. And I can tell you um, going all the way back to the eighties, you know, the relationship that our police department has had with the restaurant and bar owners has always been positive. Our reasoning for doing compliance checks was always about education, right? You know, you, here's what you need to do. Uh, we are very instrumental in getting all the bars uh, on board with getting the um, electronic and automatic license checks readers and stuff when those came into existence. And they've always been on board with that. Um, the, the times we've had to take uh, punitive action against them has usually been when a bar was repetitive in violations. So if somebody did something, you know, they had a, when our officers went into bars and did checks and they found a minor in possession, first thing we would check was it a legitimate license? Was it a false license? So we would take that into consideration. That's a little bit different than the ABCC does. They, you know, they really don't take into consideration any of those types of situations where somebody would have a invalid license, um, we would, because we knew that the bar owners were doing their due, due diligence in, in checking for um, minors, mostly minors trying to get into bars. So, you know, how we operated as an agency was September, October, November, we would um, always go in usually on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, at very specific times. Uh, we had a protocol where we, if we were gonna check one bar, we would check all the bars. We didn't wanna feel like, we didn't want it to feel like we were targeting one establishment. Um, so if we checked McMurphy's, we would check all the bars. Um, rarely would we go into establishments that serve both food and alcohol. Um, for instance, we wouldn't go into the Lord Jeffrey Inn, or we wouldn't necessarily go into Judy's and interrupt dinner, that sort of thing. That was usually complaint driven. And that was what happened with Panda East. Um, so we wouldn't routinely check Panda East. Um, we more would concentrate on the establishments that just served alcohol. So um, the ones when it was a restaurant involved would be more complaint driven. So, you know, hey, I would get emails, hey chief, we saw a bunch of young people in so-and-so establishment, you might wanna take a look at that. And so, you know, the ones that were more food serviced, we, we wouldn't go in there because quite frankly, uh, I think they would sir, construe that as a little bit of harassment. And we took that into consideration for sure. You know, um, trying to think of other smaller establishments that, you know, serve both food and alcohol. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't be a routine where we would go to those establishments. So, um, and that's how we operated right up till COVID. Now when COVID hit, everybody was closed down and we both just recently got back into um, our routine of checking establishments on a regular basis. And uh, I can tell you this, the bar business is down substantially. Um, you know, we're not seeing young people going out as frequently as they used to pre-COVID. Um, you know, it would be routine that bars were busy at seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night pre-COVID, and that's just not the case anymore. Um, you know, one establishment, um, sta I mean, it's not stackers, the spoke, seems to be the busiest establishment. Um, the owner of that establishment has a great rapport with our police department. Um, if we see a concern, we notify him of that. And he's been very receptive to the recommendations that we've offered to him. So, um, 
you know, that's a lot of information. I get it. Um, but that's kind of how we operate. Um, so pre COVID, we were in the establishments a lot, checking IDs, making sure that they were doing scanning, making sure they were keeping track of the number of people in their establishments. You know, they all have counters at the door with their doormen. Um, we don't enforce, um, the number of people in the bar, that's a fire thing, but we would notify fire if there was uh, an establishment that was routinely, you know, if their uh, establishment had 99 people as their maximum capacity and they consistently had over 99, we would let the fire department know and they would come along with us the next time we did a check. So uh, we work cooperatively with them. Um, certainly work cooperatively with Steve and his group inspection services and that sort of thing. So again, I'm, if there's questions, I'm more than happy to you know, answer those now, but that's kind of how compliance checks go. There's no set schedule, but there's kind of an unwritten set schedule. Oh, thank you very much. It's really yeah. helpful. Any questions? Um, yes, Dylan. I got a couple. First one is, um, so for the checks, is that being done by just a uniformed officer uh, coming in or is there anything ever Undercover, it's all all uniformed. Yeah, yeah. Good question, Dylan. So m the majority of the checks are done in uniform. You know, officers will go in usually two at a time. Um, go in, check IDs, making sure everybody's in compliance. Make sure nobody's being overserved. So they look for the fact that everybody's of age. They look to make sure that people are not being overserved. So if they see a drunk patron with a beer in their hand, they would bring that person outside and just have a conversation with them. You know, so those are the types of things they look for. If we have something that would be consistent with um, complaints and or, you know, officers saying, you know, this didn't look right, we would go in with uh, plainclothes officers. And, you know, I go back to the Panda East incident um, that was a complaint driven investigation where we sent plain clothes officers in uh, because we were getting complaints from both citizens and other members of the community like looks like a lot of young people are in there drinking at very specific hours and it was early, you know, five o'clock to seven o'clock and um, so that that would result in a plain clothes officer, usually from our detective bureau, and we brought in the ABCC to assist us with that. I should also mention that, you know, we do compliance checks at the liquor stores as well. Um, those also involve going and making sure that they're checking IDs, you know, have uh, ID scanners. Um, those are very um, much complaint driven as well. If somebody says, hey, look, there was a lot of young people going into this liquor estab establishment, we would uh, have plainclothes officers view that and make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Thank you. Thanks. Gaston? Thank you, Chief, for, for joining us. I wonder if there's something that we can do to try to, you know, improve the relationship with the ABCC and, and, and the police that, you know, is there, do you see anything that we might do a communication to try to, you know, get the, the two processes working together? Yeah, so I mean, what I was going to do, and I talked to Steve about this was because I wasn't aware that you know, Ted Mahoney may have left or maybe had changed some of his responsibilities because he would always reach out, not just to my agency, but Hadley, Northampton, anybody that they were um, going to do compliance checks with. They usually wanted a uniformed officer with them because there were times when, because they're always in plain clothes when the um, ABCC comes into town. Quite frankly, people didn't believe they were with the ABCC. So there were times one of them got assaulted. Um, so, you know, I think they appreciated the fact that a uniform officer was with them. So I was a little surprised when Steve told me that there were some compliance checks done by the ABCC and we weren't notified of that. So um, I was going and Steve gave me the contact of, of um the individual who's now in charge, I was going to just reach out to him and say, hey, look, here's how we've all, always operated in the past. Uh, if this is something you want to continue, let me know. We're more than happy to help you out. Um, quite frankly, I feel very positive about the relationship my agency's always had 
with the bar owners. I think our bar owners do a great job in a college community. Um, we have very few incidents of people being overserved or minors being served um, because we keep a close eye on that. And as do they, I mean, that's their livelihood. You know, um, if somebody leaves the bar intoxicated and gets in an accident, you know, they know that their livelihood is at stake. So, you know, they take that as, as you know, very serious as well. So, you know, I was going to tell Steve, I'm going to reach out to the ABCC and say, hey, look, is there a change of policy on your end? Let us know how we can help you. Here's my concerns. And um, that's a conversation we'll have. So, you know, if, if necessary, I'll reach out to you guys. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, Gaston, do you want to go again and then Dylan? Sure. Just want to say, well, I guess uh, we've, we've kind of served our information function. Uh, glad that, that that's useful. The, um, the I was going to raise another question, and, and so we can table it if, um, uh, depending on Dylan's question, and that is about any feedback you have as we are going to be, you know, getting applications for the um, the, the, the license that became open. Yeah. So uh, I don't know who's going to end up with that license. You know, I would request a meeting with those individuals just to know, let them know what it's like to own an establishment like that, where there is a college community. So they're very specific protocols I would ask that they follow. Um, so when that time comes, uh, if I could get the opportunity to either meet with those people and speak with them, you know, I, I always get the approval to do the back, background checks with liquor licenses, which I appreciate, but um, also have a face to face meeting with the potential candidates that who may get that license just to know, you know, how we're more strict than most, you know, probably than most towns and cities when it um, comes to licensing of establishments because there is the potential for minors being served and that sort of thing, so. Uh, maybe we can come back to the logistics to make that work um, with talking with Steve before, yeah. before you leave us, yeah. Chief, thank you. All right, thanks. Dylan? Uh, yeah, so I got um, one of the things that uh, we're, we're speaking of, of the liquor licenses that we're trying to figure out now are we're reworking setting our costs for liquor licenses. And one of the restrictions that we have is it can only be associated with what the cost of administration is. And one of the questions that we have really is what are our costs of administration? And I think enforcement obviously goes into that. Um, do you know what, the, or are you able to get what it would be for the police department, what it costs you annually for uh, to do this kind of enforcement. So that way we'd be able to say, all right, well, we know where police cost this and we can kind of build that into our uh, liquor license price point. Yeah, I, I can tell you this, um, Dylan, you know, we're, our, we're at a reduced staff level now with our agency. So it used to be very standard that we would have on say between the hours of 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., six or seven officers working. Um, now we have three. So it's going to be more difficult for us moving forward with that sort of, um, uh, with that number of officers to go into the establishments to do the, these, like, these um, compliance checks. So we may have to hire people on overtime to do those um, because it used to be very easy. We had officers assigned to the downtown district. That was part of their responsibility to go into the bars and restaurants and do the compliance checks. And now that we only have three officers working per shift because our fund, our funding was cut and our level of officers working per shift is, is down, it's going to be more difficult to assign officers because it, it takes, there's time involved. I mean, you don't just go into a bar or restaurant uh, and check one license, right? You, you, you check multiple licenses, you make sure that the patrons are being served properly. There, so there's, you know, it, it's a half hour, 45 minute process um, where our uniformed officer is inside that establishment. And um, so I think it's be gonna be, it never used to be a cost concern. And I think that's gonna become a concern in the future. So I could probably give you a better idea of what that's gonna look like moving forward. 
I, it's probably not going to be in time um, when you guys change your, your the regulations or the rules, but you know, there's going to be a cost associated with it. Okay. That's good to know. We can certainly take yeah. that into consideration. I think yeah. if I can just follow up, I think we've got now, because we've already done the licenses. So I think we've got really till closer to the end of the year before we have to make, before we're really looking to make a change, before we go into the impact. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, a, a number by the end of, before the end of the year, that way we can kind of build that in. And then I don't, I don't know the budget side of how that all works of then, you know, are you guys then, then uh, recoup that from the, the town? I don't know how many that is, but I imagine that that would all be, uh, you know, we, we obviously want to uh, charge in such a way that it's actually getting to where the cost yeah. is actually going rather than just, you know, a general fund kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, by the end of the year would be easily easy to do from our perspective as far as cost analysis. Um, typically, our fee fund goes into a general account. So if, if, for instance, I overdrew on a certain account, I could draw from that. So, um, and that's through the accounting uh, office. So, I, you know, I would feel comfortable being able to give a figure and saying if we went over that or matched that, it would it would all work out. And then, uh, sorry, one more question. Uh, more. Not quite as related, but just kind of, you know, from what I've heard in here, I heard we were down, the police department was down 10 officers or so. Mm -hmm. Is that, and are those positions not being filled or, or is it, that's just kind of temporary trying to restaff. So um, last budget year, we were defunded two officers. Um, so we were at 48, we're now at 46. And then we had a number of officers leave and retire. So we currently are funded at 46 and we have 42 officers, or excuse me, 41 officers in house actually doing police work. So um, the process of hiring new officers is difficult. Um, you know, this is a conversation I have with the town manager and the town council frequently is it's not as simple as just hiring new people. The process of hiring a new officer is, usually takes about a year between interviews and then sending them to an academy and getting them graduated and then training them. So, you know, um, and the academies don't always run when we need them to run. They only run about three times a year and they're 22 weeks long each academy. So it's a long process to hire officers. Okay, thank you. Are there any, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anything else to add? No? Those, those cover my, my big ones right now. Right. Gaston, one more? Uh, yes, I, I, um, so we expect to get multiple applications for the open license. And so I wanted to confirm whether your request was to try to meet with them before we identify who we would like to give the license to. And if, if that's, the, I mean, that, that makes sense. I don't know if that's what you were asking, but if that's the case, I, we, we should talk with Steve now about how to make that work. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think as long as the individual, whomever it may be, that is being, um, and again, I don't know your process for the decision of who gets this license. Um, at some point, whoever that is, is going to need to have a conversation with me and, you know, Captain Ting and operations just to, so they understand what our expectations are about running a liquor establishment in a college community, because it is different. Um, there's no question about it um, and what their expectations are from us. You know, we're there to serve them, to assist them and, and give them advice. Um, and our relationship with the establishments have always been outstanding. So just an opportunity to speak with them at some point. Okay. Yeah, Dylan. Yeah, just uh, one more question. I guess uh, logistically from our point of view, I guess it would probably make sense then for us to approve a license uh, pending approval from the police department like we do for, for most things. I was going to say procedurally, it could even make our job easier if, if we had you vet everybody before they even came to us. But I think that would be uh, a whole lot of meetings 
which is only going to result in one of them uh, meaning anything. So I, I think the former makes the most sense. Do, do we all think at this point in time that that is the way to go? Approve contingent on approval from the police department? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, Gaston? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, waiting to see if, if Steve had a comment. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, the other side of it would be if, um, you know, you could give your feedback about what would distinguish a strong application because we may well get somebody who hasn't been an operator before. And so, you know, what I, should we bring to that kind of an application for, you know, if, if they're otherwise it appears to be a strong and interesting opportunity for the community. Yeah, I, I can tell you that past practice and I've been doing this for 12 years as chief. Um, there are times when people have been approved um, for a liquor license and then they don't meet the approval because there are automatic disqualifiers for at the ABCC level. So, um, you know, there have been times when people have been approved, you know, at the local level and I have not been able to approve them at, the, at my level and at, at the state level. So okay. it probably would be, you know, it would make a transition smoother if I had some knowledge about who was applying, absolutely. Yeah, Chief, we will be sending, um, as per usual, the uh, the applications along to your office for a background check, so we can just make sure to get those off early, and um, and you can you'll have all their information there, so you can schedule uh, a meeting with them as you're able. Yeah, that's great, Steve. Uh, again, the majority of the people who apply for these types of licenses know the ground rules, know what are the qualifications, so it doesn't happen often but it happens when somebody applies and they're just, there are automatic disqualifiers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there disqualifiers that um, at the local level that are different from what ABCC would deem disqualifiers? Not really. Um, you know, it's very pretty specific because they do have the right of appeal, right? If I deny a license, mm -hmm. they certainly have that right of appeal. Um, so I kind of stay to the same rules that the state level is at. Great. Yep. Great. Any more questions or comments? No? This I mean, is very, it, very helpful. It, it, is, yeah. there, it, is there something that we could put on the books as a guideline for licensees that would in any way you know, facilitate the, the work of the police department? I mean, I don't know if you do know, uh, I mean, if you um, notify the applicants, but, you know, not, notify them that the police department is part of the process. It, it might assist you in weeding out somebody who would be applying who wouldn't necessarily be um, a, a suitable person to apply. But, you know, it might just be good knowledge for them to know that there's a process where the police department reviews background investigation, that sort of thing, so. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. You're um, very welcome. Yeah, Any? this has been very helpful. Does anyone else have another question? Are we, well, I guess, uh, thank you so much for all of the information. It's very, very interesting um, to learn everything about the ABCC and for all your help with the, the new license applications. All right, sounds okay. good. Thanks, right. you guys. Thank, Thank you buddy. very much, Chief. Thanks a lot for coming. Yeah. See you, Steve. All right. Well, that was interesting. Um, Informative. Yeah. Um, okay. So I mean, just, let's... It just kind of following up, I mean, I, I think it got it's there's a capacity to kind of come up with an estimate of hours, and it's easy to price an hour. Um, yeah. And so I think it would be, it, it will be very interesting to do a reality check of whether our sum total of license fees are, are in the ballpark at all, or is it 20% or is it 200%? I, I have no idea. So I think it's gonna be a really interesting exercise because that's just one of the expenses for the town of, of having liquor licenses. It's not the only one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Do we, um, so we have our, when we put the license, the, the announcement up for the new license applications. Does it listed in our, um, Steve, did you link to that, the liquor license guidelines and regulations? And that mentions the police department, is that right? 
Those should be on the website, but I don't believe they are directly linked to on that posting we had. No. Oh, okay. You just referred to the, okay, the Board of License Commissioners. But we do mention that the police will be vetting them in some way in the, that document. I believe so. That's yeah. Correct? I mean, that's part of the standard uh, practice. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. All right. Um, great. So let's go move on to Mandy Johanneke and rental registration. Welcome, Mandy. Is she here? This promoter oh, to be a oh. panelist, it might take a minute. Oh, right, right. Okay, I can see the little microphone is there. We go. Out. There yep. we go. <laughs> Hi. It took a little bit, but yeah. thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thanks so much for being oh. here. Yeah. So um, I know you've been emailing with Gaston back and forth and talking about uh, the Board of License Commissioners and its role with the new rental regulations in town before they go up before the town council. And one of those was the point system. I would think you put aside for the time being. Is that correct? So yes. I just, yeah, I think we just wanted to get, you know, get some more information, have, ask some questions. That yeah, kind of so thing. I think I sent Gaston the one that was the the and and I apologize for not being as on top of it as I always intend to be to get you guys the, the most recent versions. They change and then I forget. But the December version hasn't changed that much to what will be in the packet uh -huh. this week for next week's meeting. Um that there's there's a couple of updates, but not much has changed from that one to this one. And so so where the board of license commissioners is continues to be involved in the draft is in fee setting and in the two fee setting and regulation setting except what what the council wants is that they want to set the first set so that means what will get passed on to you would be an already adopted fee section fee schedule fee everything and an already adopted set of regulations the council under the current draft would adopt the first set of all of that and then we would hand it off to you <laughs> then you get to do what you want with it um, um so that that's one of the big things that the board would have at this point um is the eventual changes to any of the regulations adopted under the bylaw and any of the fees so the sort of the need to update the fees occasionally and stuff like that which you're already doing as i heard for many different items and the council's mm -hmm. trying to do it for the ones we're involved with um so those two and i believe the last time we talked that the board was um okay with having that authority um and also i i just would love to confirm that still um, and then the next set of things where the board would be involved, um, I'm going through my search, is basically in the appeal process. Again, taking your comments from the last time I, I came to you, um, and the appeal process for, at this point, it's written as only appeal, the appeals only happen from suspensions, revocations, and denials of permits or denials of renewals. So um, there aren't, we we have not included in this draft appeals from just a basic violation of the bylaw. So the $300 fine or anything, really what we've said is the only thing um, that can be appealed at this point, at least under this structure, is if the town refuses or to give you a permit to let you rent your your property. Um, and then that whole section has basically stayed the same at one point. Some of it was in regulations. It's moved back into the bylaw um, at, at a town attorney recommendation to have it more in the bylaw. Um, and then that that's where your big responsibility would be. Um, if we suspend or revoke or deny permits. Um, um, it is my understanding that under the current system, a permit has never been suspended, revoked, or denied. Um, right now, the current system has a separate rental appeals board that would be created. It has never been created. Um, and so one of the things we were looking for is um, if it's never been created and if it doesn't happen that often, can we put it to some other committee that's already used to this? And, and you had indicated that you were good with that. I think you had some questions about that process. 
Um, and we are certainly a CRC open to any and all comments you have about the language and the process um, to match whatever you guys do for your other appeals um, and, and stuff like that. We don't really want to reinvent a wheel. Um, we've pulled most of this, I believe, from the current bylaw, although it's been months, so I can't tell you exactly what's in the current one and what's not. Um, but I think most of it came from what currently the Re Rental Appeals Board would do. Okay, thanks, Mandy. Um, just a quick oh, and, sorry, one more thing. You wanted about the, the point system. That yes. is gone. Um, point system. So, so that is at this point gone from this bylaw. Um, I would suspect it's not going to come back in this bylaw. One thought the CRC had was to move it, move a point system potentially to the nuisance house bylaw as we rewrite that one. Um, and so suspension, so, so we've gotten rid of a point system to determine suspensions and we've left suspensions up. Um, I'll just summarize what could get a suspension or a denial. A denial is anything for not completing an application. If your application is not complete, you're not going to get a permit. Um, you know, you can be denied if you're currently suspended. Um, and you can be denied um, for failure to pass the required inspection. So if you don't meet all of the application requirements, some of which are inspections and all, you could be denied your permit. Suspensions would be for, um, again, failing to remedy any non-compliance issues. So failing to remedy those inspection problems. Um, eventually you could be suspended on that. Um, immediate suspension is if there's unsafe structures, um, they might immediately suspend. Um, it has never been done, including in those unsafe structures found by the code enforcement officers. Now they tend to prefer to use the state building code to clear out a building without needing to actually suspend a permit. Um, the public nuisance bylaw suspension. This is the, the, the one where the point system would have come into play. Um, and what we're trying to do is link other bylaw violations to the permit system. And so this is not completely set yet and CRC has not discussed this yet because the bylaw for public nuisance, public house, uh, nuisance house has just gone into revision and gone into a packet for next week. But the thought is if you hit a certain level of nuisance house violations, which we're renaming the public nuisance bylaw, um, but after a third or a fourth violation at a certain point, you would be deemed, the property would be deemed a nuisance property after warnings after violations after corrective action plans some of the stuff you saw on the point system would go into that um if the house if the property is deemed a public nuisance a nuisance property then the building commissioner would have the option to suspend the rental permit it would not have to be an automatic suspension but that's where we sort of brought in a point system without actually having a point system um those are basically the only things that a permit could be suspended for right now that you would be dealing with in terms of denial or suspensions. Okay, thank you. Um, just one quick question, if we go back to fee and regulation setting for a second. Yeah. Um, so they're adopted by the town council and we would have the authority to change them thereafter. Will our changes require town council approval? Not as currently written in the bylaw. Okay. It would pass directly off to you. Or and just you pass would... off to us, okay. Yes. All right, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, any questions from Mandy, Dylan, Gaston? Yes, Dylan. Uh, I, I think we talked about it before. If uh, So it, it's going to be the way that it works. If a place is marked as a nuisance property, the uh, building commissioner can revoke the license. Uh, I'm assuming, I, I haven't been to any of those, those meetings for discussing that, with some of the thinking that is the case of if you have perhaps tenants living there that that we don't necessarily want them to be evicted but would maybe prevent uh new tenants coming in is that maybe some of the rationale behind it you know you got student rentals that are there but they're seniors once they go they're not getting in a new set of nuisance seniors is the idea maybe that, that's part of the thoughts yeah um so the the approach is and and as i said crc has not talked about the nuisance house revisions yet um they have just landed in the packet i they'll land this week soon <laughs> when 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 our clerk um can post them online but 
um, the, you know, right now the nuisance house bylaw has sort of a three-step process. There's, and it, it's, and you can only be cited under the bylaw for gatherings that cause public nuisances or underage service of underage alcohol service and furnishing and drinking and all. So it's a very limited amount of what causes a nuisance. And so one thing CRC has been asked to do is to look at that under a different referral and say, is that sufficient? And, and we basically said we want to expand what is a public nuisance on a property. Um, but if a, if a violation is written the first time and the second time, the owner does not get notified at all. Um, it's just whoever was causing the nuisance that gets the violation currently under the bylaw and under the third time, then the owner would get notified and become partially responsible and any subsequent ones after that within a one year period. Um, so the thinking is to expand what a public nuisance is um, to some of the um, maintenance issues that are really neighbors are really having some issues with, including littering on properties, you know, um, parking not outside of the parking management plan, um, you know, vegetation issues where things are just overgrown really bad, um, you know, and beyond some of the other behavioral issues of noise and all. So some, some sort of long-term thing. And the way it's currently drafted would be that on the third violation, again, based on violations, the third time a ticket was written, the property would, within a 12 month period, would be declared a um, problem property, at which point the owner would have to submit a corrective action plan and work with the town to um, correct the issues that are public nuisances and figure out a way to do that. And then only if other violations occur after that plan is implemented within a certain amount of time would a property be deemed a nuisance property and only at that time could the owner become liable for the fines and could a rental permit if applicable be suspended. Um, and the goal is basically we want to fix the issue um, we don't want to take away people's livelihoods in general. We want the nuisances abated. We want the quiet enjoyment returned to neighborhoods. So, and and one thing we were thinking was a point system can get very complicated. So, so that's why we've moved to this sort of direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gaston? This is all helpful, um, Mandy. I, I wonder nevertheless if you could try to imagine what's the most likely kind of appeal that could possibly come actually happen so that we can work with something tangible. So I would suspect the most likely one is um, for either, um, I, well, I would actually suspect if, if a, um, for a suspension, probably under a potentially new public nuisance bylaw that fourth or fifth violation under that that then would trigger the potential suspension or denial of a permit under that. Um, and I am guessing that because our history, we've had permits that could be suspension ability for those code violations for the past decade that this has been in effect and our um, building commissioners have chosen not to use that. Um, and so, you know, the other one that might happen is they might get denied for not being able to produce all of the application requirements. Okay, that that one that one I think we can we can handle. Um, mm -hmm. But let's imagine the public nuisance. So who is it from the town who's going to tell us that the um, the new it was indeed a nuisance? Who's going to be arguing that to us? So there would be. I'm just thinking this through right now, the, the, the way the public nuisance bylaw is drafted right now for potential revision, um, it would be police officers for criminal because they can only do criminal citations. So there would either be a citation multiples and remember, it would have to be at least number four um, okay. on a property. And so there would be multiple citations issued either by a police officer criminally or on the non-criminal side, police officers or inspectional services. So, so it might be 
John Thompson or the chief building yeah. inspector. It might be a health inspector. It might be an electrical inspector, or it might be a police officer for each one of those issuances. And then yeah. the person who would actually suspend the permit would be our principal code official, which would be Rob Moore, our building commissioner. Okay. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, Rob and or health and police and it would have been suspended or the, the action would have been taken because they did actually have the number of violations. So what's the scope of judgment that we can exercise? I mean, we can't overrule the, the town law. We can't say that the, that the violation didn't occur because it, it did occur. So what can we actually, on what grounds could we reasonably overturn the town's judgment? Uh, good question, right? Um, so we have put discretion in the they may suspend right now is is how it's written. I do not know whether the committee will keep it as that if there's an if that hits to that problem proper that nuisance property designation. Um, it is both both sides are written both bylaws are written. I believe I'm checking the the um, the this one. Um, may revoke or suspend yeah both of them are written as may and so it's a discretionary thing and so you know i'm not a practicing attorney and i'm not giving any legal advice but yeah, yeah. i would say you could potentially say they the the since it's a discretionary suspension yes you've met the four you've met the nuisance property but was it outside of the discretion to actually suspend the permit because they happened over multiple different X, Y, Z tenants or the corrective action plan wasn't what is being implemented? You know, potentially something like that I could see would would be so where we're, we're, we're there. Where we go. We're there to grant mercy. <laughs> potentially is what I would but say. Yeah. yeah. Is, do, is, do we have any scope to do anything but be merciful? As is, and, and I mean, I'm trying to understand like what, how we would reach a conclusion that the suspension should be overturned. And um, I mean, I'm I'm being very mindful of how flat-footed we were the one time that we were um, in a kind of adversarial. Uh, p posture between two people that we normally like to just do what they say, and th that's the the town manager and um, and Gabrielle Gould um, about how much uh, to uh, kind of cut license fees during the pandemic. And so we're like, we like to say yes to both of you. What are we supposed to do here? In in a case of this appeal, we like to say yes to Rob. And so. Um, I mean, I guess are we just going to be like the the nice parent, you know, who 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 might say, uh, "Dad, you're being a little harsh." Uh, <laughs> is that the scope of what we're supposed to be legitimately doing? Um, reading the bylaw as written for appeals, I would say yes, um, or potentially um, saying, you know, we need more. Some of the items that it says you would be allowed to do are to overturn, sustain. Yeah right? Um, yeah, yeah. Put a stay involved, um, but okay. a consent agreement. So you could okay. add potentially additional requirements, right? But yeah, so so a way to um, sort of confirm a, the town's decision or not confirm that decision with a residence, right? You know, residents okay. tend to like sometimes having it confirmed by fellow residents instead of town staff. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I mean, it's helpful for me to hear that talk through. I don't, I don't know if, uh, if you all agree. I mean, the, um, the other issue that, um, that's looming large here is the fact that the town is you know, short thousands of housing units and the remedy here is to take one off the market. Um, and it seems like the only way that this could really advance public policy is if these suspensions caused the owner to sell. To a more responsible landlord, is it, and so I'm just wondering if the design can achieve that, can provoke that, and and then I had a doubt 
just to confirm whether this, the suspension is attaching to the landlord or the property. So if, if, if a landlord from one day to the next transfers the property, does the suspension get erased or is it, does it travel with the building? Um, I'd have to read closely about whether the suspension attaches to, I, I mean, it attaches to the permit. So that's the property, but, okay. but okay. at property ownership, permits can be transferred. So I'd have to go back and okay. really read the language closely about that. Um, the suspension can also attach to only a particular unit, even though the permit is for we, we like to use the apartment complexes, but not necessarily. It could be a triplex or a duplex or something, but it would only attach potentially to if the suspension is because of inspection issues versus a, a nuisance property issue. Okay. It could only attach to the particular proper, the particular units at issue. Yeah. Um, there was another question in there that I forgot. Um, me, me too, but I guess thinking it through then the question is whether oh, it was oh, housing sorry housing. the housing issue i mean i think the housing issue means that we're gonna always want to find a, a consent decree and we're, we're gonna want to reach um you know in order do this this and this and and you're okay um and we're going to be taking guidance from rob mora about what um what should be included in that agreement but it's Kind of weird to get there and ask Rob to help us draft that because we're only there because he's he suspended. Um, so um, I there's something there that's that that um, seems like a design issue. Yeah, um, I I would be happy to I, I'd welcome thoughts on how to fix that design yeah. issue, right? Because yeah, yeah. it might be a design issue. Um, I mean, but, I think um, what it means is that- To go back to the housing issue, yeah. there are some counselors that would hope suspensions do serve the purpose of removing the rentals from a rental unit and moving it into an owner-occupied unit, depending on the suspension. Okay. Um, there are other counselors that the, the main goal would be to fix them up, right? Um, to, to make sure that, that the units themselves are safe and habitable and, and they shouldn't be rented if they're not. And so don't let people live in there if we really have these problems with inspections and maintenance and stuff. Um, and that may result in it going from rental to owner occupied because a landlord may not want to. Mm -hmm. um, but it may not, right? Um, so I can't say definitively one way or the other because different committee members are and have different thoughts on that. Okay. okay. I mean, I guess the the that structure would seem to lead, I guess Rob, if he's the the person holding the role now, to reach agreements and of what the landlord should do. Um, because when it's coming to us on a suspension and the record shows that they didn't actually do the things that they were asked to do, then yeah, what are, what are we going to do, but affirm the suspension? Um, so, I mean, I'm not a, opposed to us having, um, a deterrent role <laughs> kind of, or, that lead, lead, that affects how, um, Rob and the landlord uh, interact, even if the scope for us to do things is is very narrow. Yeah. Um, so we're just essentially giving them a public hearing. Like it would work sort of like, like I'm trying to think back as down to the Porta hearing. And of course yeah. that was like, that was, you know, we issued the license and then had to take the license away, but it was sort of in sort of all in a house and here, but the way that it worked is that there were members of the public and police officers and everybody kind of coming. So um, I guess it gets everybody into the room at the same time to talk it through after all of this has happened. And maybe that's one benefit of it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. So, um, any other questions for Mandy? So, what's our next step with this? Do you uh, send us another draft? Oh, sorry, Dylan, did you have a question? Uh, I did have a, a question. You mentioned something in the beginning about this is going to come to us and we're going to have broad authority to change it. Uh, I, now, the idea of doing uh, more work, uh, volunteer work on this is, uh, yeah, it's, I don't think it's going to happen, but what's what's in here that is uh unchangeable or is this really some bylaw that we really can just be like now we're getting rid of this whole thing and we're revamping the whole thing is that is that something we could do I, not really okay. sort of it depends on the section so the bylaw you wouldn't be able to change right the bylaw is solely within the discretion of the council once the council adopts it so any language in the bylaw or any requirements of the bylaw itself you could not change um, with the fees, the council would initially set the fees and then it would go to you to set the fees um, after that. And so, you know, the council recently, after 10 years or nine years, changed the fee last year on rental permits. Um, it sat there for nine or 10 years because it was part of the legislature to do so. <laughs> and so one thing we were thinking was, you as the board of license commissioners are probably more in tune with fees you talk about a lot of fees more regularly and the council generally doesn't set like any fees and so this one might get lost in the fray um whereas it might not with with you all because you're constantly looking at fees or you're you're I, at least i've heard you've got a goal to have a schedule of reviewing fees um the council wanted I would say the feedback we got from the council was they wanted to be able to set the structure. Uh, that doesn't mean you couldn't change the structure once the fee schedule is adopted and, and that is completely right now still under discussion as to, is there a different fee for a 12 unit building than a one unit building? Is there, how is it based? Is it based on the number of inspections that need to be done or is it just a permit fee that includes inspections? We're in the middle of those discussions but the council really wanted to sort of be the first be the adopting group for that structure, as well as the amount, you would be able to change the structure if you wanted. But I think the assumption would be mostly the amounts, unless the structure is not working, right? Um, and, and all. And so if the structure is not working, or if you don't like the structure, you'd have the complete authority on that. On regulations, um, this is where it gets complicated. So the bylaw has certain requirements that must be met. And then the regulations right now talk about what some of them might be. And so um, I'll send you, I'll make sure I send you a copy of the regulations. But for right now, the regulations include the entire set of what questions to ask for the application. Most of that has been pulled from the bylaw. So almost all of it would be totally at after adoption, the board's discretion to keep or remove. Um, and which is why it's been removed from the bylaw because things change, especially with energy efficiency or other types of questions. Some might not be necessary after a while. That would be fully your discretion, except for the two items we said needed asked in the bylaw. You'd never be able to get rid of those. But beyond that, the discretion would be yours after the council has adopted regulations. Same with the energy efficiency requirements. We've put them in there. We've right now drafted them at the request of ECAC, um, and they're the ones that have provided us the language. Um, it would be my recommendation that if you wanted to touch that, that you go back to them <laughs> and let them do the work for you on that. That's what we've done as CRC. Um, the other set of, you know, and let, let me pull up the regulations to make sure I don't forget anything about what's in the regulations. Um, where is that go? So the the regulations also then include um, the inspection requirements, which we've drafted sort of from the current bylaw, but we moved them in. So that's how does the inspection work? What are they looking for? Um, what happens if an inspection has failed? How long do you keep the documents and the inspection information and stuff like that? So, so that would be um, something that you could change after adoption. And then um, 
Then we have in here property management plan requirements and parking site plan requirements are the only other sections of the regulations right now. Um, I would say the what CRC envisions is we've been working on these and working on them with Rob and John Thompson and all in the you know, building commissioner inspectional services department on what the regulations need to include. We've worked with ECAC. The changes would come if it's not working for them. I don't envision another sort of big um, push into do we need to add or subtract without a recommendation from Rob or John or ECAC or something like that where you'd have to start from scratch. I think it would be more of Rob or Steve, who I think handles our permitting application requirements saying, you know, this set of requirements isn't working. We need to review this list um, is, is how I personally envision the regulation modification happening. Got it. Okay. Okay. Great, any more questions from Andy? So, um, when do you think you're going to send, when, or when would you like to send what you're drafting up to the town council? So, what's your time frame? Um, early March right now is the early time March. frame. Okay. Um, we have a meeting on the 26th for CRC um, where we'll be reviewing the public nuisance bylaw for the first time. Um, and starting to review sort of the general bylaws are near finished. The, the, reg, the permitting bylaw is near finished, I would say. We're on to the final, what do people want to finally discuss? So we're into sort of those, those final revisions at this point of picking out little okay. things on that. I think that's where we are with regulations. We still have a lot to go with fee structures because it's very complicated as you know with other things. Yeah. <laughs> And, and setting your own fees. And then we have this public nuisance. We've got the 26th. We have at least one meeting in February. Um, it might take two to get to the council after okay. the 26th. So I'm envisioning early March. We have a public um, listening session scheduled for February 13th, um, which will be the last one that CRC holds. And that the goal is to have near final drafts for everything for that session. February 13th. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so and I can get you final, near final drafts of probably everything after the 26th, and I'll make myself a note um, for that, or, or the meeting after that, the February 9th CRC meeting right before that listening session, where that's where I hope to be able to sort of say, here's our kind of finalish drafts. Um, and then we'll be working on final changes after comments. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions for Mandy? Nope. All right, Mandy, thank you so much. This yeah, was really, you. really great, really helpful. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks. It's a lot of good good work. And yeah. I'm glad that we can you know, serve a, a ceremonial function that I think can <laughs> can, can work. No, it can- it, it, I think it, it will. The whole point is that it never comes to us and that, that makes it work. That's yeah. the whole goal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Bye. Well, again, very interesting. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm still here. I'm just eating some pizza that just okay. arrived. <laughs> All right. Um, All right. Steve, do you have any uh, reflections on our comments? No, I think. Um... It's clearly a well uh, a well thought out plan, and um, I, I think it would work pretty well. I think, um, yeah, I don't I don't think um, I think I you know the discussion you you'd mentioned your email there. Um, I had also talked to Rob today, and he didn't really see much of a chance for something really a technical appeal to come before the board. It would really okay. be kind of more of you know multiple violations yeah. that themselves can be appealed to different authorities, but it would really okay. be um, kind of a collection of things that would ever come up. I, I forgot to say it at, at the end. I wanted to stress that they have to keep it May, like May suspend. If if they change it for May, then we really have nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So, so we go, oh, ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. No, you go ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna say we do if if we are um, wrapped up with this conversation, we do have one other person in the audience waiting to uh, to present something. Oh. Okay. All right. Who is this? 
Um, this is for uh, Garcia, Mezcalos, Inc., um, oh, right. their live entertainment license renewal. Um, in association with the change of hours he had filed and the change to a nightclub-style format, there were some significant changes to his live entertainment license, so I thought that it would be best to bring him in for renewal to uh, present those changes to you. Oh, great. Thank you. So, oh, Mr. Um, Mandela. Yeah. Federico, can you hear us? Hello? Federico, you are muted if uh, if you are trying to speak. Can you unmute, Steve? Um, I I can request he does, so I've done that. Okay. Yeah, he's muted there. Maybe he um he oh, just stepped up. There we go. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Mandela. Welcome. Good evening. I'm out here screaming my lungs out. I see the button. I'm mute. I'm so <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Sorry. Right. Hello, so everybody. Hello, Hi. so you are changing something about the live entertainment license for Garcia's. Actually, it's fine. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. <clears throat> All right, let me, uh, okay. So yeah, we changed the hours on the license okay. to better accommodate anything that happens at Garcia's now that we are changing the hours for entertainment. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanna provide a DJ on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we have mariachi band and I've spoken to Steve about the hours for mariachi. <clears throat> and so we have the hours, I think from, from five to one, but in reality, the mariachi is only there from five to eight or six to nine. They really go for three hours, mm -hmm. but in case that somebody might want a special event on a Monday, um, we have those hours extended. So that way they, can have like permission to stay there at a later time. Okay. So what were the hours? Must I put this on a uh, speaker? Give me one second. I okay. Don't. So just if this is what you're asking, Marion, the um the uh, application <clears throat> in the packet for this week was the new his new proposal. Oh, okay. That was the new one. All right. Okay. All right, I'm yeah. back. Okay, Gaston, let's start. Go ahead. Um, Gaston. Thank you. I'm just curious if you could share the vision okay. for how you'll be setting up a DJ. Are you hoping to have dancing as well or just like more energy with the music? No, that's a great question. And yes, uh, we are hoping to put a dance floor out. Uh, we work with the town and we show them a blueprint um, from A to C on how we plan to do that safely. And we, we have shown to the uh, building department, we work with the fire department to make sure that if an alarm comes on, the music and speakers, I mean, any music on the speakers, I'm sorry, and the lighting, because we have lighting up on the ceilings that is safely hooked up to the electric system, where if an alarm comes on, all of that will shut off and all of the lights of the restaurant will come on 100%. So people have a safe way out. Um, and the same with uh, a hookup that we put on there uh, for, an, electric, for a, an electrical outlet for a mechanical bull that we actually had had there a couple of times already on Wednesday. So we're trying to make a Wednesday for the mechanical bull. We had to remove some tables and open up space. And we have done uh, that a few times actually and we just want to bring a little more of a nightclub spirit to Amherst. We see a lot of kids standing on the lines outside of the bars downtown. And we want to make sure we provide um, a roof for those kids. And um, one of the concerns from, from the town was um, that these folks are going to be coming in and out to this, uh, to this building and and coming in, drinking and all that. So in order to uh, make sure we don't deal with any um, situations that we cannot handle, we wanna charge a fee at the door. And when people go out, they will lose the ability to come back in. So that will force them to stay in there. And we are planning to have a security personnel there. We already have somebody at the door checking IDs, even these past few days with the mechanical bull. So whenever we spot an ID that doesn't check that is valid 
we don't <laughs> allow them to consume alcohol. And the people that are actually of age, we'll put a stamp on them. And we keep, we keep an eye on them, make sure that they don't do anything silly while they're in there. We, as, as an establishment, we want to make sure we bring in people to enjoy themselves. But we don't want it to be a, a safe haven for people who want to come in and consume six drinks in one hour. That's not our mission. Our mission is to do good business. Um, we have a, a long contract for the building and we want to make sure we do everything as safe as possible. So when we bring the, uh, the DJ, the DJ is going to be on, on one corner of the building, which is already set up with the cables and all that, um, all the all, all the instruments that we're going to place are almost attached to outlets on the walls. So there, there won't be any cables along the, uh, the dining room. And I wish I could show you a video, but we tried uh, during Halloween, when we asked for permission uh, to Steve and, and it falls out of town. We actually opened up the dining room and it's, it's huge. I mean, we're talking probably 50, maybe 50 feet by 30 wide and that's a big place for a dance floor and a dj now we don't need a huge dance floor because we only plan to have around 200 people for our capacity we're not planning to bring a thousand people and we will never do that but like i said we want to do a responsible business and once the uh the school comes back in want to be more consistent with the DJ and have things booked and also hopefully bring in some bands when the students are not in to keep it at a more responsible level. Thank you. It's very exciting. Um, yeah. I'm glad that you've got the idea of uh, having some exciting place to have a roof above your head in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, Dylan, go ahead. Uh, first, I want to just preface by saying, uh, one, I'm excited. I think uh, I think this is going to be really good, too. But you guys have been doing a bang-up job over there. I have uh, I have never had a bad experience over at Garcia's. The food is just incredible. Uh, Thank you, Dylan. Appreciate it. Now, the one thing I will say, now, I, I'm, I'm only a little concerned about this, is when I look out my front window, I see Garcia's. Uh, and yeah. I, hear, I hear spoke on Friday, Saturday night, and that's fine. You expect it. The one thing I know is just how I'm configured. I hear uh, anything coming Garcia's really loud. How are you? Uh, obviously, there's going to be noise on a Friday and Saturday night. You live in a college town. You expect it. But kind of what is uh, what is just your general kind of noise mitigation to kind of keep as much of the noise in the building to really, uh, I'm not sure offhand what the, the, the levels for decibels, you know, so far away from the building are, but really how are we making sure we're, we're adhering uh, to that? That's, that's a great uh, point of view. Um, so the DJ will be in charge of the decibels and, and making sure that the noise is at a, at a level where it doesn't go out of the building as much. Right now, the way we set up the speakers inside the building is uh, if, if, you, if you're familiar with the restaurant, when you first come into the restaurant and you have a box stop area where the booths are, mm -hmm. we have some speakers up on top towards the back. We don't have any speakers on the front. Obviously, on those evenings, the speakers on the outside will not be live. And we want to make sure that we keep it towards the back of the building as much as we can towards the parking lot. So that way, it doesn't affect the people around or across the street from the restaurant. And I went to the, uh, we had some uh, comments about the, um, the, the sound level from across the street from the park. So what I did one day, I, I put up the speakers at a medium level, almost above where they are usually on uh, while the restaurant is operating. And I went on with my phone, my cell phone in my car. They went around the park across the street. You could not hear it, but I just want to assure you that we're not going to be um, bringing the speakers to a max volume um, I, I don't think it's necessary because a, a lot of times, whatever you're at, if you're at the spoke or any other establishment, I, I, anywhere really, and you come in with some friends, you're going to also have the ability to talk to them. So 
when we had the speakers set up in uh, Garcia's, we had them set up facing away from what's the bar area. So that way when people come in and ask for drinks, so we have to engage in a conversation with customers, we can actually hear each other. So when I have more information about the decibels and all that information that the DJ is gonna set up in there, I'm gonna make sure I forward that to you guys so you guys know at what levels is gonna be um, is gonna be set up once we start going with the nightclub. Uh, thank you. And then I'm sorry, one more question. You guys get doing a mechanical bull every Wednesdays now? Yeah, I mean, we, we're trying to make it a, an attraction. Um, I mean, we're a business. We're trying to make some some money. And I, I think uh, it's worked out perfectly because Wednesdays, Mondays is mariachi band. Tuesdays is kind of off day. Wednesdays, we want to keep the mechanical bull because when the students come back in, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is going to be uh, a dance floor. So we need double out of there so you can allow for uh, for room so people dance and then sundays is still up in the air but i think we'll do some uh some latino music uh for for those folks well yeah i'm gonna have to make it by on a wednesday for this mechanical bowl that sounds you like should <laughs> if you last eight seconds your dinner is on me <laughs> wow. <laughs> don't hold me to it you might be too good for that yeah. yeah. Uh, that's I, quite an insurance policy I imagine you had to get for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually had to get a policy for that. Uh, we got a yearly policy. I had to pay it in full. Uh, it was pricey, but I think uh, in the scope of things, it's something that is going to attract more customers to Garcia's. And, and we are doing things a little different than a normal restaurant. We have the space. We cannot slice the restaurant in half and pay for half the lease. Yeah. But we can bring more entertainment. And with you guys' yeah. help, uh, we, we're going to be able to do that. Uh, best of wishes. And, um, you know, I wonder if some radio ads would help, uh, local radio ads would help get people in for those Wednesday nights. We're thinking about doing some radio. We're choosing between a few uh, local popular radios. And we're yeah. just thinking budget. But I think it's going to be on, on the radio. And we have ads on, the, on TV already on Channel 40. Uh, those folks on the next round, they're going to add the mechanical bull on there. Oh, fun. That'll get you them. guys got to make it. Dinner, <laughs> then yeah. it, don't, worry about, uh, don't worry about the job on Mondays. Come in on a Friday, relax. Ride the bull, a couple of margaritas, guys. Put a smile on your face. Guys. You, guys, you guys work too hard. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Mandiola. Um, so it all sounds really great. Um, so, Steve, Thanks. do we open a hearing for this one to vote on it or no? Um, I guess it is just a renewal that's being modified, so I don't think a formal hearing would be required. Okay, great. Um, so uh, if everyone is done with questions, uh, is there a motion to approve the license live entertainment license renewal application with the changes to Miss Collie's Inc. doing business as Garcia's Restaurant? So moved. Thank you, Dylan. Is there second. a second? Thank you, Gaston. Any further discussion? No. Um, we'll take a vote. Dylan. Aye. Guest on. Aye. And I vote aye. That is three to zero with two absent. And the changes and the license has been approved. Thank you so much for coming in, Mr. Mandela. We're really looking thank forward. You, Marianne. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, thank you, Guest on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I want to point out, Steve, thank you so much for your assistance. You have been great. I truly My appreciate pleasure, Federico. Help. I'm glad to All hear right. that. And I wish you the best of luck with your uh, your new changes. I think it'll be good. Thank you, guys. We'll see you out there. Have a great night. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, that's great. I was going to ask if the bull was coin operated, but we don't do that license anymore. Do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Secondhand. So you're right. So um, common victualers. So can we just do all of these or should we? Well, yeah, do none of these on. have any significant changes. Okay. So. All right. So is there a motion to approve uh, the common victuals license applications for Crazy Noodles, Pizza House, Amherst Oyster Bar, Savannah's, and Protocol Amherst. So moved. Thank you, Gaston. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thanks, Dylan. Uh, any further discussion? Nope. Um, we'll take a vote. Gaston? Aye. Dylan? Aye. And I vote aye. That is three to zero with two absent. And then the last one we have to do is Savannah's. The live entertainment. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the live entertainment license renewal for Savannah's? So moved. Thank you, Dylan. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you, Gaston. I'll take a vote. Uh, Dylan. Aye. Gaston. Aye. And I vote aye. That is three to zero with two absent. That license has been renewed. Um, Just a, a question. What is the live entertainment at Savannah's? Oh. Let me pull that up. I think that's it's, a good question. Um, it was a renewal, right? We used to yeah, it's a renewal. renewal. Yeah, I'm just they, wondering okay. what they what what I was they like, do whoops. <laughs> I think it's um the option of having bands. Well, let me pull it up. Okay. Are they do they do like a, a brunch jazz band or something like that? It might be something like that. Yeah. I think that's ringing. Okay. I'm just let me load here. It is uh yeah, live magic live music acoustic slash jazz. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, great. Well, that's all done. Um, so we already did our discussions except for upcoming meeting schedule and agenda. And so our next meeting is February 2nd at five. And Steve, you said we needed to, you sent an email, we need to do um, conflict of interest training. Yeah, so um, I got that email. I mean, it's a pretty simple training online. I mean, you could you could get started on it if you want, it is required, but we okay. can um, discuss it more thoroughly at that meeting. Okay. All right, and then we should probably talk about, do we want to talk about rental registration? I guess we should bring Doug and Hallie up to speed on what happened and also on the enforcement, uh, the compliance check discussion with Chief Livingstone. And is there anything else that is in the works currently? Um, I did so? have um, somebody inquiring about um, wanting to amend the uh, BYOB bylaw to possibly make the hours earlier. Um, oh, okay. there is a... Um, a restaurant's looking to do a kind of brunch thing. Okay. So um, I told them they could come speak to the board and um, I think they are gonna try to make it on the second. Okay, so we should put that on. And then, um, oh, I just forgot what I was gonna say. Um, there was one more thing. I can't remember. Um, sorry, I, I'm drawing a blank. So those, uh, does anyone else have anything else for discussion items or? next time. Oh, I was going to ask Steve, and this is kind of in topics not reasonably anticipated, which we can move on to. Um, have there been any applications yet? Or have you had any yes, inquiries? I, yes. Surprisingly, only one has formally come in, but I have had some inquiries. Oh, really? Okay. Um, but we did re receive um, a change of manager application for the spoke as well as well as a new license application for the spoke live, which is going to be a nightclub um, oh. located in the site of the former Old Town Tavern. Old town. Where is that? That is um behind spoke. Behind the spoke. Yeah, oh, that's behind Street. the spoke. Really? Oh, right Did between... he buy that property? I believe he has a 25-year lease. A 25-year lease. Okay. Interesting. All right. Wow. Okay. We're gonna be nightclub central. That'll so. be a big one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that'll uh, be good. Uh Steve, do we who who are they listing as a manager? I don't know off the top of my head. I I think I have that application locked away. Let me see if I can. Uh, it might take me a minute to dig this out. So uh, it would be um the gentleman would be rich leopold i have no idea who that is well all right we'll okay. find out more about him i guess as the time comes um will he be there he, he should be there right yeah if if, yeah. if if yeah whenever we schedule it I probably can get it on the next one but okay okay Okay, great. Um, anything else? That would be for the original spoke. There's a different manager proposed oh, okay. a new one. For spoke live. When is Which, that one coming up? Um, that one, well, we'll have to do our notice and everything with that one. The manager for that one is proposed to be Colin Hughes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I, I think I know who Rich is. Yeah, Colin is my neighbor, he used to be my roommate. He's the guy who mostly is the on floor manager over there, so. It's nice to see they're finally making official the people who are actually managing the spoke on a day to day. Well, speaking of the conflict of interest training, that might be a good thing to look into. I don't know if a former roommate relationship would. 
Oh. Would be, oh. But that might be something to uh, think about as you take it. Yeah, right. I got to check that out. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm also worried about the conflict of interest of uh, being enthusiastic about, um, you know, the mechanical bull. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to deny this license. Wait, well, hold on. <laughs> what if we do a mechanical bull? <laughs> All right, you can have your license. Get out of here. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So if there are no more topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Dylan. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Gaston. We'll take a vote. Uh, Dylan. Aye. Gaston. Aye. And I vote aye. That is three to zero with two absent. All right. Well, great. Good meeting. Um, thanks, everybody. And see you all in the second. See you all then. Thank you. See you all then. Thank all you. Right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Steve.